Hello everyone, this is Mrs. Lindsay. Uh, today is our second day of graph theory. And today we're moving on to, again, we're in the Tannenbaum portion of the book, which is in the first part of the book. And we're gonna talk about um, the traveling salesman problems. Okay, we're in chapter six. All right. Okay, so what is the traveling salesman problem? The salesman has N cities in his territory. He must visit each city in the territory once. He must also start and end his sales trip in the same city. How can we decide the most economical and efficient route? Okay, well, let's do an example of this first of all. Willie is a traveling salesman, customers in five cities. We will call that A, B, C, D, and E. Willie needs to schedule a sales trip that will start at um, at an end at A, which is his hometown. And he goes to each of the other four cities just once. Other than starting and ending at A, there are no restrictions as to the sequence in which Willie's sales tour visits the other four cities. Okay. So here's an example, okay. Now, what's different about this one than what we did in the previous unit, if you notice that there's some costs associated here. Um, so if he's starting in A, and if he goes to B, it costs him $185, but if he chose to go to C first, it costs him $119. So again, um, it looks like we don't want to waste money. We want to find the cheapest route. So again, we're looking here. Among the many possibilities for a sales tour, we want to find the cheapest or the most optimal one. So how can we figure this out? And that's what we're going to answer today. Okay. More generally, the traveling salesman is a convenient metaphor for many different real-life applications. There are several examples. We'll just talk about a couple of them. I'm going to start with this first one and let you read that next one. This one is talking about um, touring the moons. Um, so, you know, we have a solar system is about to be launched from planet Earth. Um, we're going to explore the first three moons of Jupiter and the last two of Saturn. And we want to collect rock samples at each of these sites and then return to Earth. So the next slide will show the mission and years between the two moons. Um, and again, an important uh, goal of the mission planners is to complete it in the least amount of time. So this one's talking about time where the previous one was talking about cost. And we're still looking for the most optimal um, route we can go. Um, and again, we here we're starting with Earth and returning to Earth. And then we also have this roving the red planet. Um, this figure shows seven locations on Mars where NASA scientists believe there is a good chance of finding evidence of life. <clears throat> and you can see, um, I'll have this on another screen. We'll return to this problem a little bit later. Um, but you can see that we have all the different data in this table here. And again, this one we're gonna um, go to again. All right, so a little bit more about that, though. Um, so again, you must first land at A, go back to A, take your samples. Um, like I said, we're going to keep coming back to this, but take, uh, go ahead and feel free to read this. We'll come back to this problem as well. Okay, so again, in each of these examples, the fundamental problem is that we have a tour of the sites. Starts and ends at a certain site, visits each of the other sites once. Okay, we also want it to be optimal. So in other words, the least cost and that cost can change depending upon what we're talking about. It could be cost of money, it could be time, um, whatever makes it optimal. Um, so any problem that shares these common elements, you have a traveler, a set of sites, a cost function for the travel between the sites, again, that could be time, it could be money, and the need to tour all the sites and optimize it, minimize the total cost. So it's super important, this little portion right here. All those characteristics, that is known as the traveling sales problem, or we will abbreviate that TSP, okay? So again, there's various examples of that. Here's a few other ideas. Um, routes of a school bus, delivering packages, UPS, FedEx, uh, fabricating circuit boards, running errands, something as basic as that. Okay. So 
Every traveling sales problem can be modeled by what we call a weighted graph. That is a graph such that there are a number associated with each of the edges, which we did not have in the previous unit at all. Okay. The model always, again, has the same basic structure. Okay. The vertices of the graph are the sites of the traveling sales problem. And there is an edge between X and Y. If there is a direct link for the traveler to travel from site X to Y. Moreover, the weight of the edge X, Y is the cost of the travel. And again, we talked about cost can vary slightly. So a complete graph is a simple graph in which each pair of vertices is joined by an edge. Well, what is a simple graph? Okay. All vertices are completely interconnected. And also, there are no loops or multiple edges. So again, all vertices are completely interconnected and there are no loops or multiple edges. That is what a simple graph means. Okay. So in other words, also a complete graph has n vertices is also denoted by k sub n. And here's a couple examples of these graphs. Okay. So again, you can see that there's one, two, three, four, five vertices, so we designate that as k sub 5, okay? This is a completed graph. Again, A connects to all of these the other four cities, if I'm referring to the tra traveling salesperson or the other vertices, okay? An example of a graph that is not complete, just to kind of give you an example of that, I could draw something like this. Again, this point a does not connect to all the vertices, okay? And there's other vertices on there that don't connect to all of them. Here's another example, six vertices. Again, that is a complete graph there. And just a few more examples here. The more vertices you get, obviously, the more lines you get, the more edges, the total edges. You can see when we get, I'm sorry, this should be K sub seven. I'm not sure why it showed up like that. Um, K sub 12 dramatic increase in the number of sides, edges that you have. And here is when you have 20, okay? It almost even looks like a circle, but it is not a circle. Um, okay, so let's talk about some properties that we might have of this case of n. Every vertex has degree n minus one, okay? K sub n has n times n minus one over two edges, why? Well, let's talk about this just a little bit. And I'm gonna talk about that down here. If I talk about the total number edges, I have to think about the number of diagonals plus the number of sides. Well, from geometry, which we're actually gonna to get to a little bit later, um, once we get done with graph theory, Number of diagonals in any polygon, there's a formula. It is in Oops, apologize. I'm not sure why that does that to me sometimes. So in the number of uh, vertices times n minus three. Now n minus three stands for the number of diagonals at each vertex. And then we divide by two, so we get rid of the repeats, okay? plus the number of sides, which is simply just n. If I do a common denominator, distribute through, do a little bit of algebra there, when you add those together, you get n times n minus one all over two, which gives us again, the total number of edges that can be drawn in a polygon, okay? So again, that's a little flashback there uh, to geometry. Okay, of all graphs with n vertices and null multiple edges or loops, so again, a completed, complete graph, k sub n has the most edges. And the traveling salesman 
problem. The goal is to find a tour. So in other words, a circuit that visits each vertex exactly once. So Hamilton circuit is a circuit that visits each vertex, each vertex exactly once. How is that different from an Euler circuit? An Euler circuit covers every edge once, but it can repeat vertices. So Euler, let me just go ahead and write that down. Circuit. Compare and contrast the two. This one is covers every edge exactly of a graph exactly once. but can repeat vertices. So what really switches here? So edge and vertices switch. So now if I talk about a Hamilton circuit that covers every vertice of a graph exactly once, but it cannot repeat edges, okay? A Hamilton path is a path that visits each vertex of the graph exactly once. So again, what's the difference between a circuit and a path? Circuit, the starting point equals the ending point. And again, I apologize about my handwriting. Um, again, I try to repeat it as often as I can. Uh, but uh, if you have questions, of course, email me, let me know. In the path, the starting point does not equal the ending point. There are two different points, okay? All right, so let's take a look at a Hamilton circuit. So here we have a graph, one, has Euler circuits. The vertices are all even. So again, we have um, some algorithms that help us out with that. And two, it also has Hamilton circuits. So the first, here's an example. One circuit is you start at A, then you go to F, then you go to B, and again, I'm just following along here with the sequence. So A, F, B, then we go to C, then we go to G, D, E, A. So we started and stopped at A, right? Started and stopped at A. Notice we did not hit every edge. That is the difference from an Euler circuit. Euler circuit, we would have to hit A, B, E, B, E, C, A, D. We do not have to do that in a Hamilton circuit. Now, can we find more? And the answer to this is absolutely, okay? We could do, pick a different color. I could just do something like, hey, I'm gonna start here with C, right? Starting there at C. Then I go, I can I follow the exact same path. And I usually like to do the dash, but you could do commas. C goes to G, goes to D, goes to E, goes to A. Now I'm right back up here, A goes to F, goes to B, and I go right back to C. So again, I start and stop at the same point. And again, there's several of those. I just happen to follow the same path. Um, but again, the point is there can be more than one. So I'm sorry if you hear the beeping in the background, I'm actually out in my backyard. So you might hear some birds and some various things, but uh, it's such a nice day, I couldn't help it myself, so. Okay, all right, so let's do another example here. So determine if the following graph has a Hamilton path or a Hamilton circuit. Well, you know what, let's, let's review. Does it have an Euler path or circuit or neither? Well, if you recall, we need to figure out what are the degrees of each of these vertices. So degree here is four, degree here is also four, 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 one, two, three, four, two. All right, so it's all even. Hopefully you're saying all even vertices. So hopefully you're realizing that it's a circuit, not a path. Does that have anything to do with a Hamilton path or circuit? Well, let's see here. Let me erase these because uh, I don't really need to know any of these degrees here while we're thinking about this. So... Let's see. Okay, let's just start at A, just because it's alphabetical. Let's see if we can figure this out. Let's go from A. I don't know. We'll start in our alphabetical order. Let's go B. 
and I'm just kind of picking my order here. Um, we can go down to, I don't know, let's go to F, let's mix it up. And then how about to C? Then let's go to D. And then we go to E. And then we go back to A. Started and stopped. Didn't hit all the edges, but we did hit every single vertice. So this has for sure a circuit. Okay, let's see what else we can do. Um, you know what, let me label these, and then I want you to try this one. Yours might be slightly different than mine, um, but let's see, let's see if you can come up with one. Okay, so I labeled all the vertices, so take a moment, pause the video, see if you can come up with a path and or a circuit. Um, and then uh, push play when you're ready to check your answer and we'll talk through it in a little bit more detail. Okay, so in this case, I found a path. I started with A, I went to G, to J, to D, to E, to F, I believe I forgot one, to I, to C, to B, and then to H. Okay, so I found a path. Can we find a circuit? Well, hopefully you notice something about this graph. It's not complete. So no, we cannot find a circuit in this case because think about, I'm just gonna pick one vertice, B. If I look at B, it does not connect to I, does not connect to G, does not, does not connect to every single vertice. Okay, so in this case, we really can only find a path. All right, so let's compare Hamilton to Euler. Quite the title of that, but that's okay. Comparing Hamilton to Euler versus Euler. So we have all these different polygons, A, B, C, D, they're all up here, E, F. So if you see, okay, can we find a circuit? And again, we have very specific algorithms for determining a circuit. If we have all even vertices, it's going to be a circuit. If we have exactly two odd vertices, we'll have a path. Is that the same with circuits for and a path for Hamilton? Well, right away, you can kind of see that there isn't a pattern there at all. Okay, so yes, a circuit here, yes, a circuit in Hamilton. No, a circuit, no, so that seems to be the same, but now we get down here, we see no and yes, and then it flip-flops, yes and no. So again, it really kind of doesn't seem like there is a relationship between the two. I do want to point out, hopefully you saw here at E and F, these again are not complete. So E and F, you should not be able to find a circuit, okay? And in this case, you can't find a path either. All right, so what does this show us? All right, it shows us that, again, the existence of an Euler path or circuit in a graph tells us nothing about the existence of a Hamilton path or circuit, or vice versa. Okay, so again, really no relationship between the two. Um, and again, it, it's important because we definitely have uh, very specific theorems that help us determine Euler circuits and paths, but not um, if it exists, I should say, not for Hamilton. Okay. So in deciding whether or not a graph has a Hamilton circuit is difficult. Unlike the case for Euler circuits, there's a simple criteria, but not the same for a Hamilton circuit. However, it's easy to see that complete graphs will always, always have a Hamilton circuit. Okay. In fact, K sub N Polygons have lots of Hamilton circuits. Well, how many? Well, if M is a positive whole number, right, then we write M factorial, M factorial, yes, that's an exclamation point, so hopefully we're kind of pulling back from some of your algebra probability that we've done before. M factorial, you start with one times two times three times dot, 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 all the way up until you get to whatever this number is. So for example, if I'm doing five factorial, that'd be one, times two, times three, times four, all the way up until I get to five, and I multiply those all together. That's what factorial means, okay? So in general, the number 
of Hamilton pass of a polygon k sub n equals n factorial. But the number of Hamilton circuits is n minus 1 factorial. So again, there's going to be a lot of circuits if that is a complete graph. Okay? And it's also important to know that you need only two edges that come out of a vertice. in a Hamilton circuit. So you go visit a city, then you just need to be able to leave, leave the city, right? Okay. You can tell this number grows really, really fast. So again, k sub 8 is 8 minus 1 so 7 factorial is 5,040 Hamilton circuits. That's a lot of circuits. Look as I jump down to 11, 14, 18. Look at how many circuits are possible. That's a lot. So hopefully we have something that's going to help us figure out what is the optimal, optimal one with this. Okay. But again, that's the total number of possibilities of circuits. All right. How can we figure this out? Well, a weighted graph. We've talked about completed graphs, but now we have a weighted graph. That's where we start in the very beginning. So the, tra the traveling salesman was going from all the different cities and we had a cost associated from going from city A to B. It was different than the cost of going from A to C. Okay, so again, each edge is signed a numerical value. And that value, depending upon the weighted one, it could be in terms of time, could be in terms of cost. There's a bunch of different things that it could be associated with. Distance, all those different types of things. Okay, so a completed weighted graph is a graph in which each edge is assigned a weight. Here's an example. So again, I have all my vertices and each edge is assigned a weight. Now this is a very generic one. We don't know what that stands for, but that is an example of a completed weighted, oh, actually it's not completed. It's just a weighted graph. It's not completed because A does not go to every single vertice. Okay, so how can we actually reword the traveling salesperson taking out all the different information and whether it's a planet, you're talking about a salesman, Given a complete weighted graph, find the Hamilton circuit of minimum weight. Okay, so that will tell us the optimal performance. Okay, there are several algorithms. And algorithms is a, a mathematical term for different ways, methods. To find a Hamilton circuit. We're going to talk about really three of them and talk about pros and cons of them. But there are several out there that exist. All right, the first one, brute force algorithm. This is our first algorithm for figuring out a Hamilton circuit, okay? I can tell you right now this is the one that I would use last if I got to choose out of the methods. But there is a reason that you would maybe think about um, choosing this one. And again, we'll talk about the pros and cons. We are literally going to make a list of all possible Hamiltonian circuits of the graph. We will list all of them. So hopefully that's even telling you that's going to be a bit of a con. For each Hamilton, Hamiltonian circuit, calculate its weight by adding the weights of all the edges and then find the one with the least total weight. This is guaranteed to find the most efficient circuit. That is the biggest pro to this by far. However, the biggest con is that that is a tremendous amount of work. Think about what we talked about when we had K sub 8 polygon. That was a completed weighted graph. And the number of possible actual um, circuits that we could come up with 
I don't know if you remember that number, but I happen to have it written down. It is 5,040. That's a lot of Hamilton circuits that you have to calculate and figure out. But out of all those 5,040, you can figure out which one is definitely the most efficient. So here's just kind of an example of it um, in terms of using technology, right? So here's a table given, again, the number of vertices over here, the computation times using, this is actually using technology, how long it would take to actually figure that out using the brute force algorithm. So again, it is an extremely lengthy process, even if you're using technology to help you. That is why I choose to do this last, if at all. Okay. There's two versions of this one. The nearest neighbor al algorithm. Again, and here are the steps for that. Okay, choose a starting vertex. From that starting vertex, go to the corresponding edge that has the smallest weight. And we call that guy the nearest neighbor. You continue to build the circuit in that same approach. So from that nearest neighbor, I go to his nearest neighbor. Right, so one vertex at a time, but always going from the vertex to the nearest neighbor of the vertex until you get back to the beginning. If there's a tie, choose any of the nearest vertices and continue until all the vertices have been visited. So again, just pick one and go with it. Um, there's not necessarily a deciding factor between the ties unless you kind of look ahead and uh, go from there. Again, once you visit all of them, Return to the start, and you are done. So we're going to try an example of this one using the nearest neighbor algorithm. Okay. We are going to start with A. I'm just going to choose A as my starting point. I'm just going with the alphabet here. So I go A. All right, so now I have a choice of 46 versus 50 versus 51 versus 37. Well, 37 is definitely the smallest. So that's um, 37 below it. Then where do I go from there? Well, I've already chosen 37, so I can't go back there. So I go 48 to 41 to 44. Well, 41 is definitely going to be my next smallest. So I would go this direction here down to D. And again, now I've already chosen 41, so I can look at 28. This one again is 50, and this is 53. Okay, so 50, 53, 28. Well, obviously 28 is the smallest, and that brings me to C. From C, now again, I've already chosen this 28, so I either have 33, 51, or 44. And hopefully you realize why can't we choose 51? A couple reasons, it's the biggest. And that brings us back to the starting point. We can't go, we've already been there. And can we go over here to B with 44? No, we sure can't because actually get, again, we have already been there, so we must go to E. So you'll see that that happens where you have the nearest neighbor. I'm not necessarily choosing the smallest amount, in this case I happen to be, but I've already gone to A and B, so those are eliminated. Now here from E, obviously we've already gone to B, we've already gone, so we have to go back to A, and that's 46. So if I add these all up, 37, 41, 28, 33, 46, that gives me 185. Okay, now is that optimal? Well, that's a great question. Because think about what we did here. I just picked A to start with. Could we started with, I don't know, E or B or C? And would that change our weighted graph? Well, we'll answer that question in just a moment. So this again walks through this, tells us what our answer is here. Again, that was starting with A. Pros, the nearest neighbor is efficient. The beginning graph has n vertices. The algorithm requires about n computations. What is the con? It does not always give you the optimal solution. The reason is at the end, we may be forced to select one or more heavy edges. Okay. And again, we just randomly started to choose point A. 
maybe we already know where the starting point is, so maybe that's not even a factor. Um, but that's where this next algorithm comes into play. And this is repetitive up here, so um, I should say that I'm going to make copy. The repetitive nearest neighbor. So this isn't necessarily a new algorithm. It's using the nearest neighbor. That's why I'm going to call it 2B because it's not necessarily new. But we're going to do one slightly different thing here. So it says the repetitive nearest neighbor algorithm does exactly what it says. It uses the nearest neighbor algorithm more than once. In fact, if there are n vertices, we often apply the nearest neighbor algorithm exactly in time. So that means we would do starting point A, then we'd do starting point B, then we'd go through all the different vertices, the different starting points, and then we'd compare and use the most efficient one. Okay. So again, we're repeating the nearest neighbor. So if I have five vertices, I'm doing nearest neighbor five times. So we've already done this example here. We started with A. Let's try that again. Let's try it with starting point B. So if I go with starting point B, starting here, same idea, which one has the smallest weight? 37, 48, 41, and 44. Well, 37 brings me to A. Now again, that kind of rules out, I cannot use 37 again, so I can go to C, which is 51, I can go to D, which is 50, and I can go to E, which is going to be 46. So 51, 50, 46 is the smallest, so that brings us to E and that was a weight of 46. Now, can't go back to A, can't go back to B, so our options are 33 and 53. So 33 is definitely the smallest, which brings us to C. Cannot go to B, cannot go to A, cannot go to E, so now I'm going definitely to D, which is a value of 28. And then again, I've gone to all my vertices, so I need to now go back to the beginning, which gives me a uh, value here of 50. I apologize. I was thinking we started with A, and we did not start with A, so we should not go, we should not go right here. We need to go back to B. So that would be 41. So C to D, back to B. The starting point and any point should be the same. So that should be 28. And then this was a path of 41. So again, if I add those all up, what do we get there? 185. And then we repeat this problem process with C. And we repeat this process with D. Um, if you would like, to go ahead and pause those. I will do C and D for you. You can check your answers and then... Um, We'll just, we won't do E and I'll, we'll talk about pros and cons and what our answer is actually going to be here. But go ahead and pause it, try C, try D, again, following the nearest neighbor algorithm. You might need to, again, redraw this or use a different color or erase it, um, some of those options as you go through and do the nearest neighbor two more times. Okay, so here are the answers for C and D. Um, so you get a total of 195, 185, and just in case you did do E, if you started there with E, you should also get a total of 185. So obviously using this method gives us the optimal, um, the optimal path of 185. Okay, so again, that's the repetitive nearest neighbor algorithm. All right, our last approach. Um, so let's talk about this. The nearest neighbor algorithm builds a Hamilton circuit one edge at a time, okay? At e each stage of the process, we have a path. The next algorithm builds a circuit by selecting edges of the smallest possible weight. However, we do not insist that the edges chosen from a path at all intermediate stages. Two things to keep in mind. When we are finished, the Hamilton circuit will place exactly two edges at each vertex. So again, one going there, one leaving. Always going to a city and then always leaving a city. Since we visit each vertex only once, we can never complete a cycle until we, all vertices have been visited.
All right, this is called, this is the third method, the cheapest link. So here's the step. Pick the cheapest link, pick the edge with the smallest weight and mark it. So literally I'm going to make a list of the weights. From the smallest to the largest. And we will start with the smallest edge. Okay. We will then pack pick the next cheapest link and mark it. We will continue choosing the cheapest link every single time, but we can never close a circuit and we can never place three edges at a vertex. Okay. How do we know when we're done? Well, we connect the last vertices. So we'll go through this process here using this exact same diagram. So comparing it to 185 that we got using the repetitive nearest neighbor, we're going to see if that's what we get for um, using the cheapest link. Okay, so again, just like I said, step one, list all the weights from smallest to largest. So 28 is my smallest. Then I'm going to go to 33 is my next. Then I am, and I'm just going to kind of cross these off. Then I have 37 is next. 41. Then we've got 44. Then we have 46. Then we have 48. Then we have 50. 51. And 53. All right. Let me change my color here. So. We are going to start with, for sure, 28, okay? That is our first starting point. So if we choose 28, I'm gonna just highlight that. Using my blue, if you have a highlighter, that might work a little better. So I'm gonna do 28. Then I can go ahead and do 33 next. So then that's bringing me here. This is 33. So then my next one is 37. Doesn't connect there at all, but that's okay. We can go ahead and choose that. That is the next smallest, the third smallest. So, so far, these are the edges that I'm going to go with. Now I'm going to take 41. And 41, I can still choose. That kind of connects both of those segments there. I can choose that. It doesn't actually close a circuit. doesn't bring me back to um, a beginning or make it go in a circle. 44, I cannot choose. This forms a circuit. If I choose 44, that connects B to D to C. And I, that's my circuit. I cannot close a circuit. So now let's go over to 46. 46 closes my circuit, but it closes it correctly. So now I have this path right here. That closes my circuit. So that's the next one that I would choose. So I have several starting points that I could actually start with. Again, I have a tendency when I can pick it to start with the alphabet. So I can go from A, and then I can go to B. Again, I typically go alphabetical. Then I go to D, if I have a choice anyway. Then I can go to C, then I can go to E, and then I can go to back to A. Okay, so if we add all these up, 46, 41, 37, 33, 28, we get that to be 185. And look at that, happens to be the exact same thing as the uh, repetitive nearest neighbor. Okay, so that is the cheapest link al algorithm. Pros, it's efficient. Okay, its so beginning graph has n vertices and the n algorithm requires only about n computations. Cons, just like the nearest neighbor algorithm, it does not always give the optimal solution. The reason, again, is that um, at the end, we may be forced to select one or more heavy edges. So pros and cons to cheapest link versus the nearest neighbor algorithm, easier to do than the first uh, brute force one. Brute force, though, would take an extremely long time, even using technology. Okay. Okay. So last but not least, we're going to go back to this uh, red planet revisited. Okay. So let's just kind of re review this here. This figure shows seven sites on Mars identified as particularly interesting sites for geological exploration. Our job is to find the optimal tour for a rover that will land at A. So again, we know the starting point, A. 
visits all the sites, returns to A. So we know that, so we don't even have a choice of where we're going to start. Map the completed weighted graph for this red planet problem. And again, we are starting with A. If we take the brute force, since we know that there are, you can count these up, right, all the different vertices, um, that would be 7 minus 1 factorial, so six factor, there's 720 different tours. Still a lot, okay? Cheapest link algorithm is a reasonable algorithm to use. Not trivial, but not too hard either. And this is the algorithm already worked out for us. Tells us the weight for all of those. Um, and this one, the weight, the best one, or the most optimal one is going to get us to... 21,400, okay? That's using the cheapest link. So again, listing them all out in order from smallest to largest, going through, can we use them? Same idea as what we just did. Uh, and again, you can see that we do not take this one, crosses those out, they form circuits, that type of thing. And that gives us a total optimal weight of 21,400 miles. And this is the actual path, uh, sorry, circuit that we would take. Okay. Starting with A, A to P to W to H to G to N to I to A. What if we were to use the nearest neighbor? Okay, nearest neighbor algorithm is the simplest of all. And notice we don't have to do the repetitive one because we know we start at point A. The repetitive one would choose different vertices to start with. Okay, so in this case, if we did this, the nearest neighbor would give us a total of 20,100. Um, again, here's the path that shows A back to A. This is it right here, going all the way around the outsides. That gives us um, optimal miles of 20,100. Okay. Observations. The nearest neighbor algorithm gave us the better tour than the cheapest link. Sometimes the cheapest link, though, gives us the better result. It can switch all the time. There is no particular algorithm that you should do over the other. There's not one that says, yes, I need to do this one. Okay. Again, in this example, it turns out to be the nearest neighbor. Um, we can also use a computer and the brute force algorithm, but this again would take a little bit of time, not as long as um, this one would probably be a fairly decent time to do using the brute force algorithm and technology, um, but we can't always uh, count on that every single time. So again, four algorithms. I really actually said these were three because I combined these. These are really the same thing. Uh, brute force, usually I have to use technology for this. Don't often use this idea at all. Nearest neighbor, repetitive nearest neighbor. Again, I put those together and then the cheapest link. Brute force guarantees us optimal where the other ones do not, but they are much more efficient. Okay, so again, um, brute force, not efficient. Gives us optimal one. The other ones are efficient, but we don't always guarantee the optimal solution. There's no known algorithm that is both efficient and guaranteed to give the optimal performance. Okay, so this concludes our notes on the traveling sales salesman problems. And again, please remember you have the homework on Canvas. You get the four tries to do that. That is the graded homework. You also have extra practice problems that I have listed there as well. Those are just practice problems. They do not count as part of your grade, but they help to prepare you and do some practice problems. Um, again, for the actual graded assignment that's on Canvas. And there are also a, a few additional videos if you would like to do those as well, okay? And again, this concludes our notes on chapter six.